So welcome again, uh, third and last presentation. And uh, I deduce from the number of new persons who came in that you were all inspired by the title and you want to learn about digital, <laughs> digital lexicography from scratch. And I'm happy to give the floor to my colleague from Mannheim, but we know each other for a long time, Peter Meyer. So please go ahead. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Alex. And uh, thank you all for coming. My name is Peter Meyer. And this talk has the very humble aim of introducing to if introducing you to a small tool that I wrote to assist me in teaching uh, the digital foundation, so to speak, of lexicography. So um, the program that I will uh, show you is called X4ML, and uh, it's all about XML and HTML. So this is not even lexicographic software, although that's the name of this block here. It's more like more or less a didactic tool that I wrote, and I. Uh, we'll be publishing it as uh, uh, open source. So uh, this already defines our topics. So why do we need X4ML? Does anybody need X4ML? What is its purpose? So how does it work? So that's the demo part. And essentially, this is a kind of software demonstration. And uh, in the end, I will talk briefly about possible alternatives uh, and uh, what I experienced so far. OK. Um, so the software was originally developed for the specific purposes of a week-long course that is part since two, 2019 of the European Master of Lexicography, EMLEX. And uh, this specific module, which is called Modeling and Representing Data in Digital Lexicography, uh, has been taught uh, five times so far by me, uh, 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 twice on-site and three times uh, uh, via Zoom uh, due to pandemic issues. Okay, and the last two iterations used this uh, software X4ML in different stages of development. And um, I should say something about the module itself. What is its purpose? So um, the students should in that module get a good grasp of basic concepts, not, not the nitty gritty details, they are not turned into computer scientists, but just basic tech concepts so that they can successfully communicate with IT people or become IT people themselves if they want to and uh, do further study. And the point of departure for that module is a familiar case, namely internet lexicography and the well-established uh, set of XML technologies that is around and has a friendly uh, learning curve, so to speak. The, the approach in the uh, module is hands-on, so uh, the students are supposed to actually do XML, XPath, and uh, write a schema, and write some, XM, some HTML. And they do have some previous exposure to the ideas of XML, but many of them are really computer science novices, and they don't have any sp specific uh, programming skills, although, of course, some of them already did something like that before. And um, during the first three times of teaching that module with different programming set program setups, um, I, my wish list about a teaching tool grew longer and longer. I wanted to minimize the support effort in class. You can't believe how complicated it is to teach and always to fix problems that arise as, as you're teaching. Something is working here, but not working there, and you have to find out and you have to interrupt the flow of your teaching. I wanted to have one program for everything that I teach. It should be available cross-platform because students bring in all kinds of devices. It should be free of charge, ideally open source. It should be lexicography-centric. Um, uh, it should be possible to, to make one's own uh, dictionary with a few mouse clicks, and uh, usage, usage should be low threshold. So students should focus on the underlying technologies, on the XML, on the XPath, and not on these idiosyncrasies of, you know, how to um, get around the specific program. Everything should be on one screen, so not switching between different tabs and different programs to get uh, to, get to see whether you succeeded. Uh, so th and there should be instant feedback. Whenever I change something, immediately everything else changes and you get immediate feedback. No, first edit something, then save it, and then manually update a preview uh, for HTML or something like that. And the end result of that wish list was XML, XML for masterful lexicographers, as I called it. Um, so, and now comes uh, the demo part, where I show you how to use it. Installation is quite simple. There's a single file, it's a Java binary, 
And if you use it in desktop mode, as I have in, uh, in, uh, in my course, students just put it on the desktop and double click it and it, it works, ideally. And you can also use it in server mode. I didn't try that in class so far, and it's a little bit experimental, but in, in this case, you just start the binary on a server and people log on to the server and have exactly the same interface in the browser. The only prerequisite is actually to have a Java runtime, which students can just download and install with a standard installer. There is a but here, but I will come to that later. Okay, uh, that's the uh, simple interface of the tool. And the basic principle is right on the first slide. It is that all of your XML stuff is on the left-hand side. Keep that in mind. XML is on the left, and everything else is on the right-hand side. On the right-hand side are documents or files that do something with your XML. For example, it's a schema that is used to validate your XML, or it is an XPath um, file with, which contains queries that are executed on your XML. And, and so on. Okay, now let's, uh, we, we start from scratch, um, and let's just create an XML file. Uh, I will call it blühen.xml. I want to write a, a, a dictionary entry on the German word blühen, which is English to bloom or to blossom. And uh, in, the, in the beginning, we have some dummy content. I hope you can see that. I, um, it, the, the font is a little bit small. Um, there's some uh, dummy content first. I erase that and start typing my uh, XML stuff. And as I type, and this is one of the basic principles, uh, you always get immediate feedback after each key keystroke. For example, here it tells you that you uh, obviously have to close that uh, start tag of the lemma element. And once you do that, uh, the end tag is added automatically. And that's about it as far as convenience is concerned. Otherwise, it's a bare-bones approach, because I think the only way to learn this stuff is to do it manually and to really write the code and the stuff manually. And later on, when you have a firm grasp of the concept, you can use a fancy uh, XML editor such as Oxygen to help you uh, avoid certain classes of, of, of mistakes. Okay, we are already done with our first dictionary entry. Blühen is a verb, and it has one English sense, allegedly, right, um, to blossom. Now let's create another one. This is now, um, oh, let's go back. This is bloomer.xml. Bloomer is flower in English. And this one um, is a little bit difficult, different. It has two senses here. The one is flower, and the other one is head on top of beer, because that's another sense in which the German word bloomer can be used. OK. Now we can start using the right-hand side and um, create a schema. Uh, I usually teach Relax and G and not DTD, although DTD is supported, um, because it's much more structured and uh, perspicuous and e easier to, to, to teach. So I, I call it schema.rnc, and I write it. And here's the first class of mistakes that can happen. There are syntax errors in, in your Relax and G's schema. And in this case, I simply forgot the quotes around the possible values for the posts attribute part of speech attribute, uh, although the um, error messages are less than helpful. Um, and this is one of the problems, of course, of this approach. And now I've corrected and added the quotes, and now another problem appears. Um, th this, this schema, as it stands here, means that uh, an entry can have one lemma and one sense, but there are two senses in, in our XML. And you see, it is automatically the case that the system interprets the Lex and G schema that it has to be applied to your XML file. It does that automatically. There is no manually linking and tinkering to, to, to get the connection. And uh, you, you wouldn't believe how, how much time it um, consum consumes in a typical course to teach students um, uh, how to connect things in a typical XML editor. OK, so we have to add a plus sign to allow for more than one word sense in our schema, and now everything is fine. And uh, if I change the uh, schema on the right-hand side or the XML on the left-hand side, immediately all uh, panes are updated, the well-formedness and uh, the output regarding this, the, the validation by the Relax NG schema. I can even apply um, the schema to all of the XML files I have produced so far. And then, I, in this case, I get the obvious result that the XML is 
for, for both XML files, the, the XML is valid with respect to this particular RelaxNG schema. Right. We can um, co um, create a, a file that contains XPath queries. The tool um, uh, supports the whole range of X query, 3.1, but in, in class I usually teach only the bare basics of, of, of XPath. Um, there is some dummy content in there. Let's replace that by slash slash sense. This gives us the two sense elements that are in my XML file here. I can also ask for the text node inside the lemma element to get the lemma. And there is something nice. I can evaluate my XPath query on all XML documents simultaneously, um, as if they were one big XML file. So this is how XML databases usually work. And then, for example, I, can, um, I get a lemma list, a, a lemma list uh, of, all, of, of all XML files I uh, created. And um, it's technically a data, it's, it's something special. I, I, wrote, I wrote it here. It's, it's different from just applying the XPath expression to the individual XML files. OK, the final part is the transition from data representation in XML to the data presentation in, in HTML. And uh, we can create HTML files. I call this my.html. Uh, you have some initial dummy content again. And the special thing is here that uh, the, your HTML is automatically rendered in the lower part. Um, and um, mistakes, syntax mistakes, as it were, in the, of the HTML are shown right in the, um, uh, in the HTML editor. Um, and there is one uh, special, of course, we, just, we, we don't just want to have some kind of static HTML. We want to generate our HTML from uh, information that is contained in our XML files, right? And the usual thing that you would do is to use XSLT. That's the standard technology. But you cannot teach XSLT in a week-long course addressed at people who uh, come from very different backgrounds, many of them without any IT, deeper IT experience. It is simply not possible. It would be confusing as hell. So for this part, I devised um, a separate mecha a templating mechanism, which is actually, the basic principle is extremely simple. The basic principle just says, Use double curly quotes, usually called moustaches in the CS, in the computer science community. And inside those double curly quotes, um, uh, you can insert any X path or X query expression. And this X query expression is then evaluated with, with, with respect to your XML file. So in this simple example, the output is this is entry Blume because uh, in your HTML code, you have this template expression with slash slash lemma, which applied to the XML file gives the text node uh, bloomer that is contained there. <clears throat> this is all fine and good. Um, the problem is that this mechanism alone is not enough, especially when you have to iterate things. For example, when I have two senses, I might want to have an unordered list um, with, with a list item for each of my senses, right? You can't do that with um, the moustache mechanism. So how do we insert one list item in, inside the HTML per sense element in the XML? And there is an action for that that says insert code to iterate HTML elements. Um, and what this does is it inserts two HTML comments, but these comments are treated in a special way in the, in the tool. So the tool re recognizes that these are the special predefined comments for iterating uh, HTML comment. So this is the uh, basic default version in the beginning. And what you have to do is then uh, you have to, to uh, adapt it a little bit and uh, use the next path expression inside. And now you can see, let me see, well, here's the pointer, right? I never use the pointer um, because I never, yeah, like this. Um, you have a template expression now inside, and it's enclosed in, in the LE, in the list item tags. And what this says is really what, it's, what, 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 what is here on the screen. Repeat for all elements S in slash slash sense. Insert a list item having uh, its text content as uh, enclosed in, in quotes, and that's it. And that's exactly what happens, right? So this is what is rendered. And you can even, of course, display the HTML, the final HTML code that is generated by this templating mechanism. 
Okay. And uh, finally, we want to have a dictionary. So we just uh, invoke an action, show as dictionary, and then we get a, a, a basic dictionary functionality. You can select the lemma on the left-hand side. You have to configure the title of your dictionary and the way the um, head word is extracted uh, in X4ML. That's no problem. Um, so this is um, a very satisfactory last step that, that you can really see the, your end result as some kind of uh, basic dictionary. Okay. Um, just very briefly, I just mentioned this in passing. Um, XRML stores all of your files in one place, in one folder. But you might want to have different sets of files for different projects of yours. One for class, one for the assignment at the end, and so on. And for that, there is a, a concept of workspaces. You can add files to your workspaces and delete them and switch easily between them. And you can preview all files to, get to, to, uh, keep, uh, to keep sane and know what's, what's inside your um, data. And this is especially important, of course, for the server mode, where you cannot simply you know, put a, a, a file uh, in a folder, but you have to upload it some, somehow. OK. Um, how did it work? Uh, so did it work? Uh, the, as I said, the program has been used twice, once remote and once on-site. And what I can say is there has been an extremely drastic reduction of the support time that I had. It worked out of the box uh, in most cases. And what we did not do in class was talking about the program all of the time in both, in both uh, instantiations of the, of, of the course. So the, the application was mostly attention, invisible to both students and instructors, um, because it was, it was just the tool that was used all the time, and there were not many questions about how to use it. Students seem to be um, uh, have a positive attitude. There are three of them. Three victims are sitting in, right in front of me. I didn't conduct any user studies so far, because the, the um, program is only now approaching its, its, its uh, final first state, so it's, it's, it would have been a little bit premature to, to evaluate it uh, so far. But um, uh, the, the only challenge that we had was that in, in desktop mode, that's the one that I uh, tried out so far, um, the, the, the Java binary was not signed because I'm not a com commercial software developer or something like that, and so the operating systems kept complaining about unsigned possible malware and so on, and this is tricky in some cases, but uh, it wasn't too big of an issue. Okay, I should briefly mention two alternatives that I have tried out in previous installments of my uh, course. One was using Lexonomy. Lexonomy is a fantastic tool, but of course it's not meant as a didactic tool. It's, it's actually meant for writing dictionaries, right? But you can use it to a certain extent to teach the basics of how to define a schema and uh, how to define the way that it should look like in, in, a, in a browser and so on. There are some disadvantages that uh, you can see here. For example, you cannot simply toy around with XML. You have to define the schema first. Um, you have no XPath queries. And if you want, for example, to, to try out a DTD file, uh, a DDD schema, you have to um, uh, upload it, so to speak, and then it either throws an error or it's, uh, you can see the result. So this is not a dialogue process. So uh, there, there are certain aspects that are diff diff difficult to teach on taxonomy uh, if you want to uh, look at the underlying technologies. But other than that, uh, it, it, it was my second best option, actually. Um, what, is, what was fared far worse was uh, using some kind of a freely available editor and configure it. And the program of choice would have been something like using Visual Studio Code, which you can extend with a lot of extensions and so on. But you have a complex setup. You um, must juggle around between different views and invoking different extensions. And it's not made for lexicographers. It has no integrated user experience. It, don't offers, it doesn't offer you a, a, a dictionary view or anything like that. So um, this concludes my brief tour. This is XMLish, and it reads, uh, thank you for your interest and, of course, for your attention. Um, the software will be published um, at the end of the month, roughly. And there's also a publication, but um, for certain internal academic reasons, you would have, have to ask me to, to get the information on the publication. <laughs> okay, thanks for your attention.
I won't lose any time. I see Robert and... Thank you so much. It really makes me want to try it. But can I ask you, uh, would it work if I want to try it to learn XPath for uh, XML that's not exactly lexicographic or is it constrained somehow? And I have uh, another quick question. The I didn't quite get the $S seems to be an implicit loop that runs over sense. How does the how does it know it's like that? It doesn't read the comments. Or did you? Is there a convention that the first letter is? Uh, how does it? How does it know it's a loop? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not seeing. Yeah. Um, to your first question, you can use it to, of course, to 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 learn XPath. Just uh, throw your XML on the left hand side and try it out and see what happens. So that's that's uh, that's what it's meant for. And actually, what I what I use that for is to show students how searches work. Yeah, right. You can uh, how you create a lemma list dynamically and how you do complex searches in your material. For example, find me find me all um, um, entries where there is some sense that contains the word beer. No problem in XM, in, in, with XPath. And so that's, that that's, gives us gives you some feeling about how how this is um, how this could be implemented under the hood. And um, as to your second question, this is indeed something XML specific. It's a specific convention that in the context of these specific HTML comments, that must be um, uh, written exactly the way they are here. So this is why you, you usually do not insert them manually, but use it, insert them by using um, this, this action menu, because then you are, can be sure that you, they didn't, you, you didn't make a, um, a syntax mistake. But if you insert it, then, then uh, as soon as you have those moustache brackets, then the dollar inside is indeed treated as a variable um, that runs or iterates on over all of the elements in, in the result set of um, your XPath expression, right? Yes, uh, something about taxonomy. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely love it. It's a brilliant idea. But it does remind me of the early days of Laxonomy, which was actually intended to not to be a real-world industrial strength tool for producing real-world dictionaries, but more as a tool for not exactly teaching, but okay. for kind of experimenting and trying things out and maybe educating lexicographers about how they can sort of think more digitally about dictionaries. And then later it developed into what it is now, which is kind of a real-world tool that people right. use for actual projects. And because of that, I want to give you a Word of warning, I think that your students might like it and enjoy using it so much that they will actually want to use it for real world applications afterwards. So it may actually, there may be pressure for, on you to continue developing it. And you may, like I did, actually sort of try to hand it off to somebody so that somebody else can continue developing it afterwards. And think about, I mean, this happens to tools often. Think to what happens to NTLK, for example, the, oh, right, right. Uh, you know, which also originated as a teaching tool and for then afterwards for a while before Spacey came along, you know, it was everywhere. So, uh, okay, I don't really have a question. I just want to share this experience and uh, it's absolutely brilliant. I, I, I love it. Thank you. Right. Oh, thank, thank you very much. And I mean, you know, um, of course, one of the problems is this is not scalable beyond a certain, this is not very scalable, my approach. If you use the server mode, I don't think, if, if, you, if you have a hundred different people um, um, uh, hacking around with their XML, uh, I think it might already get a little bit difficult, depending on what you are doing. So uh, I will keep your warning in, in, in mind. So. <laughs> So this is excellent to have had uh, Mr. Lexonomy in the room. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and indeed, we go on indeed. To well, thank you very much for presenting this very uh, impressive piece of software. There's one little thing I don't really like about uh, this very uh, presentation here of recursion instructions, because uh, comments are normally intended to, to contain free text, which isn't unconstrained so technically how about using processing instructions which normally come from some uh, controlled vocabulary all right yeah that 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 is indeed a very very good idea uh, i i never thought about that thank you very much this this would this would indeed this is this is a, a clearly a case of complete abuse of comments right 
Obviously, it is, and um, I, I, I thought that uh, that that it's okay for the purposes of teaching, because I in teaching I usually do not introduce processing instructions because they are too far away from the purposes of the course. So it's, I don't even uh, strive to 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 to, to um, you know in, introduce all the machinery of XML. But for this specific uh, case, you're right. Processing instructions are probably the better a better choice because. This is what uh, processing instructions are made for. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we have time for a last question, short question. Yes. Okay, thanks. I'm also in line for downloading. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, do you teach then how to manually integrate a RelaxNG or a DTD to a file? And if so, you probably do it then after you taught with the tool. And do you think that accelerates the process because the students have a better notion already? or? Would it be the same to teach it in the beginning or after that? I'm wondering. So you, you, you're asking about the sequence of teaching first. Right, right. If you do teach how to insert a RelaxNG or anything, a DTD for validation, in a file. So they don't see that. It's, it's hidden. But right. if you teach it and you teach it at the end, does it make that faster to teach that? I, I think so. I, that's my impression, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's just, you know, it's just a feeling. I always... Um, um, in the end, what I do, I, I stay within the paradigm of this program. I, I don't talk about how you would do it generally. It, it depends very much on your on the tools that you use. For example, of how you integrate something like Relax and G into your ac actual backend somewhere. So this is not a part of what I teach uh, in, in the course. So um, it's, it's always XML first, and then I ask the students, okay, how, it, how can we describe the structure that we want to, to be allowable, so to speak? And then we, we come to, to, to the schema. So this is not a scheme. In, in, in terms of, of, of good lexicographical and, and, and in terms of good practice in general, it, it, uh, I think it would be advisable to teach a schema first, this is the, from the spirit of it, this is the right way to do it. But uh, from a didactical point of view, I found it um, um, easier and less intimidating to do it this way. So that's, that's the only reason. It's, it's didactics and uh, ease of view, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, before we close, I can't, uh, couldn't resist to make uh, one last remark concerning your definitions. So flower and head of, on top of beer. <laughs> And I was asking ChatGPT to give me definitions of uh, Blume and gave perfect two definitions about the flower, about poems that you can do about flower. Then I asked ChatGPT, well, couldn't it mean also something with beer? Oh, yes, of course. And I will read, that's right, ChatGPT said. The term bubble is also used in the context of beer to describe the foam or crown that forms on the surface of the beer. <laughs> the foam is often referred to as beer foam bubble, in German, beer schaumblume. So if you have ever heard this term, no. I haven't. <laughs> and, um, and can be an indicator of the quality of the beer. And um, I think <laughs> I wanted to do this remark. Since some of us or most of us will go to the round table. But thank you so much for this lively um, presentation and the very good discussion. Thank you.